So thanks so much for taking time to chat with me because I know how busy you are. And um, I'll just give a, a little introduction for anybody who actually doesn't know who you are. Um, you are most infamous for the grievance studies, which you did with two of your friends. That's yeah. uh, Helen Pluckrose and Peter Bogastian. Bogastian? Bogosian. I, I knew I was going to say it wrong. Nobody um, can say it right the first time. And then you've got this book, uh, Cynical Theories, which I'm actually in the midst of reading right now. This is what you wrote with Helen, and it's mostly based on the stuff from the grievance studies, which you're probably more proficient at explaining that for anyone who hasn't actually heard of them yet. So the grievance studies papers, is that what you want? So yeah, the thing that sort of skyrocketed okay. you to public attention. Yeah, it did. Um, so in 2017 and 18, straddling almost split evenly across the two years, um, Helen and Peter and I decided we were going to do an experiment with the academic literature in kind of cultural studies related fields. Gender studies was the original target. And so we had a hypothesis that you could write an academic hoax in the style of the famous one from the 1990s. Some people will have heard of it, some people will not have heard of it. The, a physicist named Alan Sokol wrote to show that these postmodern social commentators didn't know what they were talking about and they were misusing scientific language. So we thought we could just write a bunch of junk, cite the right people, cite the right papers, kind of be in the right ballpark, you know, men bad, um, whatever, you know, white people bad, and, and, and get these papers in without doing any academic work and they wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And we found out by the middle of, by the end of November in 2017, so pretty early in our effort, that that wasn't gonna work. And so our second plan was if, if we can't get hoaxes, let's figure out what we can get. And so we started diving into the literature and writing our own papers, but we followed a rule that we would always start with our conclusion and work backwards. In other words, we'd produce sophistry on purpose and that we would put in as much ridiculous stuff as we could on purpose. And so we wrote 14 papers starting at the beginning of December 2017. And the last, we probably wrote the last words of the last one of those papers sometime in, I don't know, late May of 2018. So just a few months, we wrote 14 academic papers, full scholarly articles, sent them to real academic journals, including the famous Hypatia, which is a feminist philosophy journal um, it is the most established feminist philosophy journal, and it's even recognized by regular philosophers as being a philosophy journal. It's so, even though it's niche, and seven of those 14 were accepted, and uh, most of the rest of them were still under peer review um, or going to get edited and sent back to peer review. And so we probably would have ended up getting 11 or 12, but the Wall Street Journal, that was according to a sociologist, not us. Um, who, who wrote about it in the wake of it. And I can't think of who, who that person is, but um, we, we would have, but the, the Wall Street Journal caught us after the most infamous of the papers, which is about dog rape at dog parks. And then the conclusion we started with, by the way, to get to was that we should train men the way we train dogs to combat rape culture. Right. So this is what I'm talking about when I said ridiculous stuff. And then we worked backwards from the ridiculous conclusion that we wanted. And so that should have been a huge, you know, sign to say something has gone badly wrong in this sector of academia, not necessarily all of academia, but certainly the sector that publishes this kind of cultural commentary, because we are generating easily demonstrable sophistry. Right. This is, this is not scholarship. It, well, in fact, we two things. Uh, one is the sheer volume of papers you were able to produce. Now, this is, yeah. seems to be something with you. You're very prolific. Um, you've written a ton of books, and uh, but there has to have been that has to have been very intense to produce that many papers in that short of a time. It was. In fact, it was insane. I got criticized because I honestly I got interviewed. I think by Andy No after the fact, and because we were in Portland at Pete's house, and Andy said, "Can I interview you about this for Quillette?" And we we're like, "Yeah, come on over, have dinner, and we'll do it." And so Andy No interviews us. And I said, I think that's the interview. I said it somewhere that I was working 90 hours a week on yeah. average. And yeah. I was for the entire year. It was insane. And people are like, it couldn't have been that much. It's like, are you kidding? I wrote with Helen and Pete, we wrote 20, actually, in some sense, 21 academic, pay, full length, seven to 9,000 words each academic papers, plus all the revisions, plus all the, the, the formatting, which I did by hand. It wasn't like I used a, a um, typesetting program to do it. 
keeping up with reading the literature at a breakneck pace. Um, academic articles, I mean, 14 papers, if that's the only ones we count, might be in an academic's entire career. And we right. basically cram those 14 in from beginning of December 2017 to end of May 2018, so six months. It's almost, um, mostly those papers would be like writing a thesis, right? Like it takes people yeah. about a year to, to do an article that they're- That's right. They're at published. least master's thesis or PhD thesis level papers. They're usually a one to two year project. And we did 14 of them in six months, plus the six earlier ones that were completely crap. That's intense. I mean, it, it's really obviously concerning that you could write that many that get serious, you know, attention and, and proper peer review and acceptance. Um, right. One got an award. I mean, the one about the dog sex was, was recognized right. as exemplary, exemplary scholarship in the discipline. Um, the peer review comments on some of the other papers were like, this is an this is a important contribution to feminist philosophy. This is an important contribution to knowledge, excellent work in feminist philosophy. Um, this, these papers were in many regards, not just accepted, but celebrated by the peer reviewers and editors. And it was, a, it was insane what was going on. So yeah, those are important points. The, the second thing is like, I watched the video that you guys were making while you were actually producing these papers and talking about the differences and in, in the ones that were getting rejected versus the accepted ones. And Helen played a big role in that. Um, so right. the point I want to make uh, of what she brought in was understanding the language. And this is important because all of these critical theories involve changing what words mean. And a lot of people first encounter social justice by hearing people speak and going, how come they're using these words in this strange way? That's but exactly is, right. They've changed the meaning of words. So can you describe some of that? Uh, oh my gosh. It's almost every word they use. They've got some spin or manipulation on. And so just for anybody listening, I have a website called New Discourses. I don't make any money from you visiting it. So this isn't a commercial. Um, but on New Discourses, I'm building a thing that I'm calling Translations from the Wokish, which is a encyclopedia of how they misuse this terminology where I try to explain what they mean when they use a word like identity or a word like critical or a word like race or white or racism or sex. It's almost every word that they use. Even if we go back far enough, even words like science are absolutely twisted, freedom, liberty. These are all completely twisted and have a very specialized meaning. But the big ones people run into are things like racism, diversity, inclusion, um, Critical is actually an privilege, important one also. Obviously. Privilege, privilege is one. Yeah, privilege normally, that's actually a really important one as well. Privilege normally refers to basically being born into money and being born into a lot of opportunity. And it carries this idea that you're going to be generally, you know, clueless because you're spoiled and that life was made easier for you. And then they've attached this to basically well, it used being to be positive like my first time oh, that too. probably ever used privilege was i'm so privileged to, to be here with you today that's, that's right? that too right that too right yeah so they've attached this negative connotation to i always think of that i was a kid in the 80s right so there was that tv show like silver spoons and there's this little I kid riding around on his train i actually worked with ricky schroeder once no kidding so yeah, yeah okay so you know, that's what that's kind of the negative connotation that's attached to the spoiled rich kid. They've mm -hmm. attached that to everything uh, to do with what they believe is dominant position in society. And so basically everything that they what that, and that's the key if we were to boil everything down is most of their misuses of language. What they've done is they've put this power dynamic into the meaning of the word and you have to interpret it through the way that they believe systemic power works. Um, so privilege means that you, it's this bad thing. It's like what you associate with spoiled rich kids and it has to do, oh, you were born white, so you're privileged. Oh, you were born male, so you're privileged. Oh, you're born straight, so you're privileged. Now there's every kind of privilege. There's brown privilege, there's gay privilege. There's, if you name it, you're privileged somehow. Um, Unless well, that's you an are- important point because this kind of thinking is not just feminism or, um, you know, black studies or fat studies, as you've come across, um, it's going into the actual hard disciplines of science and mathematics and such. 
That's right. We tried to do that with one of our papers and the reviewers literally said we've had a lot of success penetrating the soft sciences, but we've had very little getting into the hard sciences. We wrote a paper what we called feminist astronomy. I don't remember what the actual title was. We had nicknames for all of them for shorthand for ourselves because long academic titles are hard to remember. And we were arguing that astronomy is sexist unless it includes queer feminist astrology as part of the science. That was the argument we were making. Um, which is absurd, of course. Um, so we, we wrote that to show that this does have, there is at least the interest in taking root within the hard sciences. And now it has most probably, I mean, I don't know if you'd call it a hard science, but most frighteningly medicine. It's mm. deep, deep in medicine. Our, our major medical journals, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, Cell to some degree, New England Journal of Medicine is probably the worst offender are publishing articles relying on this um, blatantly politicized way of thinking that's only loosely tethered to reality almost every week. I mean, it's almost every issue now has several of these kinds of articles in it arguing, you know, that, that race is incredibly important to medicine, not to say like, oh, well, sickle cell anemia or whatever it is with a kidney protein or something. I don't know. I'm not a doctor. But not like that. Like medicine is racist and has to be reinvented from the ground up. And the best way to do that will be to give us critical race theorists the power to, to reorient medicine. Well, I'm also like, I work with lawyers. And so um, seeing this, they've also talked about how hard it is for feminist critical legal theory to, um, to advance in the legal system. And in part, it's because you know, this postmodernist idea that there is no reality, right? That, mm -hmm. that facts are subjective isn't very compatible with the fact finding process of a, of a court, right? That's right, <laughs> so that's exactly they, right. But they have managed to get these um, words to take on new meanings. So that's what they've been doing instead of passing legislation, they've been litigating in the courts of appeal so that they can change the interpretation of words and the interpretation thus of the laws, right? That's right. I Which, tried to give a talk on that recently and tried to explain to the American audience that they don't have to change the constitution to take away your constitutional rights. They just have to reinterpret what the words mean. And I use the example, which I guess resonated with people of the fourth amendment, which prohibits illegal search and seizure of property. And I said, if you start pushing the narrative, you live on stolen land and that you've every bit of your wealth is built off of the, the back of slavery and is therefore stolen wealth all of a sudden, the Fourth Amendment does not protect stolen property. It only protects legally obtained property. And so they can- That's a great example. They yeah. can subvert the actual legal protections that people have in liberal societies by changing the meaning of the words in the existing legislation or constitutional, uh, right. you know, well, I'll give you a scarier example because this is, goes back to our discussion about important words that are featured a lot, and that's the word equality. And mm -hmm. um, so you've talked a lot about the use of the word equity, which normally, mm -hmm. they, instead of saying equality, they'll actually say equity, which is mm -hmm. equality of outcome, right? Right. But um, whereas most people, you know, think of uh, equality of opportunity, right? Yeah. Um, so the word equality in the legal system in Canada now they've d redefined it as substantive equality. And that means that in order for people to actually achieve equality before the law and under the law, then you have to treat them differently. And this is yep. a key component. It's the, the main component of all feminist arguments in front of our appeal courts. This is a, a very typical trick, actually. This is the, the whole basis of their racism manipulation works the same way, is that they create and this is a hard thing if you're not talking to linguists to get across, but they create a variation of the original idea by putting an adjective in front of it, right? So now right. you start with equality. Now you have, what'd you say, substantive equality? Sub substantive, yeah. Okay. And so then what they do is they use that in the technical sense for a little while, and then they allow themselves to get lazy and they drop the adjective. And it has now, the new meaning then replaces the old meaning. And right. people don't even realize that it's happened. They, they're, they're, at first, if they get called on it, they're like, oh, I was just using shorthand, sorry. And they can get away with it. And eventually, the shorthand replaces the original meaning and everything gets muddled. And then it, once you have enough people participating in this, 
I mean, I hate to to give the any of the postmodernists too much credit, but they were talking about this exact problem. Is once enough people get involved in participating in that kind of a of a of a mistake, it's not technically, in some sense, any longer a mistake because that's an agreed upon meaning of the word. And then mm -hmm. they have ambiguity that they can equivocate within, and that is the name of the game that they're playing. Yeah, absolutely. So, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is why this type of insanity is so attractive to so many people. Why are so many people wanting to join in with this? And um, a big component of, of this, we were talking about the word privilege. Um, there's this cancel culture thing going on and the, a big part of the momentum of that is to say everybody is doing something bad or something wrong. And um, that I guess I'm kind of partially answering my own question. My theory on it is in line with alignment with Ernest Becker's um, work from the past, who will explain who that is in a second, saying uh, people get some sort of fulfillment out of watching other people suffer or be punished. Yeah, I mean, that's totally going to be one. I mean, I wrote an essay on, on Christmas. I published it on New Discourses, and I literally titled the essay, and it's describing essentially how this ideology works. I titled it Psychopathy. In the origins of totalitarianism. So there is an element of, of that, I think, for sure, that there are certain people who, whether it's because they're suffering themselves or whether for whatever reason, I know if we talk about Becker, we're going to get into terror management or whatever. Um, but th there is, there's a seeing somebody else suffer somehow elevates you above that, uh, whether it's to escape, you know, the humanness from kind of Becker's perspective or whether that's, um, you know, at least I'm not that poor sap in a more kind of just very basic understanding, or I have higher social status. One, one thing that's very important to realize, I read this the other day and it was just like, oh, of course, of course. It, money is not zero sum, but status is zero sum. And so people will compete viciously for status, especially when they have enough money um, because it's the next currency that matters to them most. Uh, right once your material conditions of life are essentially met, people will compete vigorously for status. And so by knocking people down a peg, by calling them privileged, they gain status while the other person loses status. There are other pressures as well that I've observed. One is that it, it provides a get out of jail free card for your failures. Uh, if you happen to be, and this is especially prominent in people who are, are what is referred to as elite overproduction. So you have educated people who are underemployable because the market doesn't, the, the, the job market doesn't have, we don't need another freaking veterinarian or whatever it happens to be. And so one thing you can say is, oh, I need to reorient my life, but you have a huge amount of sunk cost in that. And another thing you can say is, well, the system is screwing me. And this whole ideology provides a way to say the system is the problem. It's not my own choices. It's not what I, where I am. It's not what I've done. It's not even the university that tricked me or convinced me that majoring in something that has no jobs is something good because it's good for them and their bottom line. It's, it must be the system at large. And then if you kind of just tack on these very simple explanations, these very base explanations, it, it can appeal to people. Another thing I've run into and this is really subtle. I've found a lot of people who figured out, they kind of woke up and they said, wow, I'm participating in this stuff and I never meant to. I'm actually against it. But what happens is it actually creates for people who occupy certain, especially certain identity categories under the identity politics manifestation that it's become now, but also people who are just willing to play that political game more generally, it creates a subtle incentive structure. So if you're in a highly competitive environment, again, you know, not too many educated people, too many professional people, not enough jobs. I mean, I realized that some big problem must be coming when my brother and I were talking one day and he was like, yeah, I was trying to apply for a university position. There are 200 applicants for one job. I was like, that's bad. And I said, what about another school? He's like, that's at all the schools. I was like, that's bad. That's yeah. the, the level of competitiveness. And therefore it doesn't... It, you could have 195 of those people be completely scrupulous, fair, kind, generous people, and five of them be cutthroat. And those five cutthroat people will win because right. they will, when it's that competitive, the people who will be intolerant and vicious gain an unfair advantage over everybody else who's just by virtue of fairness. 
but it creates a subtle pressure. So you're in there, you're trying to make, this is an actual story, but I'm leaving all the details out so nobody can figure out who it is, that if somebody I know, and this is a friend of mine, so that I'm, I have no criticism of this person. But you're in there, you're talking to, whether it's a, a, the boss or a client or whatever, and you're trying to make the sale or the deal, you're trying to get the thing. And the thing in this case turns out to be a very good thing. It's not like some cynical, like trying to hawk a car on somebody that they don't want. It was, you know, it's a major project that would bring a lot of good to the world. And they're not quite there. And then you can all of a sudden say, yeah, well, I'm an immigrant. And so coming in as an immigrant, blah, 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 blah. And then that behavior gets rewarded. You hit right. that, that you hit that moral note and that behavior gets rewarded. And that, even if you don't think you're doing it, creates a feedback system that you're like, oh, well, when I, when I need a little extra grease on the wheel, you know, I bring up that I'm brown or I bring up that I'm this or I bring up that I'm that. Well, you know, I was going to just walk away, but, uh, you know, I, I'm gay. Life's hard. Da, da, da. And it, there's that little bit of an incentive. And I'm very convinced that people are drawn to incentives. And incent anywhere there are incentives, yeah. you're going to find people heading in those directions. I mean, it's a very kind of crude physical model I have pictured in my head from my background when I majored in physics. But it's like a potential well that draws things into it. It sucks. It has its own gra social gravity or professional gravity. And the further, it's one of these things where what you're doing is gross. So the further down that road you get, the harder it is to get back out without having to admit that you've been being really gross for a long time. Yeah. And I well, realized that when I talked to a young woman, actually, a couple of years ago, that had hit that realization moment. And she was like having an identity crisis because she'd been doing that for a couple of years. And I was like, oof. Well, Ernest Becker, who I mentioned before, I will just briefly describe who that is for anyone who hasn't come across him. He was multidisciplined. He was an anthropologist, a sociologist, and a psychologist. And he wrote two major books. Um, ones that that I think of always said denial of death was a Pulitzer Prize winning novel and then my favorite was escape from evil and uh, escape from evil he summarizes the human dilemma so beautifully it's so simple there's two factors you have to feel like a person of worth in a world of meaning and so uh, most of what we do is pretty much everything we do is going towards fulfilling one of those two things and how we achieve it, it takes many different forms and so I think one of the things I initially wondered about with academia and all these um, critical theories is if they want to be a person of worth and they're going to compete against all these other people, why don't they say they've all been doing it wrong and then go in for this new thing with a fewer pool of people to compete against? That's have, exactly right. I think right. that's exactly right. Um, and because the thing, and when I was looking off to the side, by the way, I have a bookshelf over here to my right, and I was trying to see, I have Denial of Death somewhere, but not on this bookshelf, apparently. And so, but I do have it. I've read it. Um, I've read part of, I forgot the other, the other book's title. The Escape something from Evil. Evil? Escape from Evil. Yeah, yeah, I have, I have read, I only had it digitally though. But okay, so um, what you're talking about is absolutely correct. And what happens with this critical theory, and this is something that's ex extremely important to understand, is that it creates its own moral system. And so when you say, you know, there's a, there's a smaller pool of people to compete against, it's virtually empty because most people are occupying morality and reality and real mm -hmm. morals. They're trying to be good people in the actual moral system that people are interacting in. The per they would have all kinds of names for it, you know, the, the moral hegemony or something crap like some crap like this. Right. And if they can create something that is separate from that, and this will tie into what we were talking about at the beginning, then create something separate from that with very little competition and pass it off as successfully moral enough. They give themselves a huge advantage. They have a shortcut to feeling like a person of worth in two senses, morally and epistemologically. And I think we're going to be able to, to, to connect some dots. But the thing is, let's flash back for one second to how easy it was to write those papers, an okay. entire career's worth in a few months. Should be no embarrassing background. to them. It, it is embarrassing to them. They just refuse to admit it because they live in their own moral system where they get to deny that and they get to, to frame it as an attack on what they're doing. And so this actually shows up literally in their literature. You can find it here and there. The first time I ever saw it very clearly is in a book called Critical Nutrition Study, Critical Dietetics and Critical Nutrition Studies, or an introduction to that or something like this. And I thought, 
authors or something like Gringas and I forgot, but I, I got asked to, to um, review this by a, by a dietitian, and he offered, he, he offered me $500 to review the book. And I was like, dude, I don't know anything about dietetics. He's like, I promise you, you don't need to. And I was like, <laughs> okay. So I start reading this book and the, the, we don't have to talk about how horrific the book is. It's exactly what you would expect, but they have this whole chapter that's like the origin of critical dietetics. And just for everybody to be clear, dietetics is what dietitians study. It is not L. Ron Hubbard. It is not right. Scientology. Okay, that's dianetics. dianetics. Okay, people do that every single time. So you, anyway, there's this chapter, The Origins, and they just talk about how we were trying to publish, one part says we were trying to publish these papers that have a critical theory view or a critical take on dietetics and nutrition. And the journals were writing us back, this isn't dietetics this isn't nutrition. We're not going to publish this. And so we decided to create our own journals. And now it's in its seventh year. And then another one, and this was more telling, you know, it was, I forget which, which sob story they're telling, but this lady has some, I don't know what you call a dietitian business. I don't know what you even call that. Uh, but she's a nutritionist or a dietitian or whatever. And she, the story, if I remember correctly, is that she's trying to incorporate all this about like indigenous herbs and something, you know, all these kind of like, kind of even literally like magic, like medicine stuff. And it's her business sucks. Like it's her, it's like, why well, couldn't make a business succeed? And so rather than say, maybe people don't want this, or maybe I'm bad at this. It was nope. Everybody hates indigenous people. There's a massive problem against indigenous people in our society. And if we can force people to care more about the indigenous people. So what they did is they created this situation where they're failing. And if they go into this alternative universe where they make up their own discipline, their own journal, eventually their own book, their own academic departments, they have no competition whatsoever. And they're the only ones there. So they flourish. And if you can, and I noticed at that point, I was like, oh my God. They create a parallel discipline that they then kind of just force into existence. And that's where I saw, actually, we mentioned a moment ago, the dropping of the prefix, the, of the adjective. So mm -hmm. you have dietitians and you have critical dietitians. And eventually you just drop the critical part and all dietitians have to do this unless they want to be chauvinists, of course. Right. Well, in the legal field, um, it's very similar with the feminist legal theory. They wanted to advance their ideas, but um, they couldn't get you know, peer reviewed articles to the extent they needed them. So they created the women's legal journal and mm -hmm. then they peer review each other's work, which of course mm -hmm. they approve because they all believe the same thing. Right. And then they can go in and, and then they cite each other in, in yep. different court arguments and nope, that's uh, exactly right next and thing so you know the supreme court yep. is saying you know yep that's the, that's the process and the, there are certain things there you know at some point somebody decided at the university at the administrative level wow look at this body of literature we have to take this seriously and create a department somebody at the library decided wow this is an academic journal and i it was sage or taylor and francis or whatever already was like well i don't care what they're publishing I don't know the difference. I just want to make money selling academic journals to libraries. So yeah, we'll carry your journal. And then the library's like, oh, it's from Sage. Must be legit. Boom, the library has it. Now it looks like real. It's, it's on par with nature in some regard. You know, it's not quite the impact factor or whatever else isn't there. But there they are right next to each other and say, oh, well, we have academic journals too. And the, it's this whole like it's funny because they're so against bootstrapping, but they're literally bootstrapping themselves into existence um, and credibility. They do it also by giving them each other awards within their little circles. Like, oh, you know, I won teaching award of blah, blah, the such and such teaching award or the such and such law award of the year. And it's like all, it's so incestuous. Mm -hmm. That was the, the actual feeling we had. Um, I was referring to it when we were doing the papers, the grievance studies as uh, uh, academic inbreeding. Yeah. Well, it's, um, yeah, it, it's definitely a concern when the only experts that agree with you are all your friends. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and then it's being presented as if these are all completely neutral, um, confirmatory, self-confirming, really. You're just like, I'm an expert because me and all my friends say so. Um, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, so I'm going to move to a, a different thing I wanted to discuss connected to your Twitter usage because you're, you're quite prolific <laughs> on Twitter as well. 
Um, one of the results um, to the, these studies and to the work that you've been doing uh, is that basically you get, um, you know, called all kinds of names that you get, uh, they try to discredit you. A little bit. Um, and, uh, but then there's also people who are doing similar work, who are doing some great stuff and, and have powerful voices uh, as well. So one of the things that I found with these alternate communities, like, you know, that are trying to, to be heard in this big sea of, of dissent, um, or, you know, you're like, I think what I said before, so you're like an ant trying to climb a mountain and then there's like yeah. these government funded feet ready to squash you at every turn, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is, um, I think it's really great that within your circles of people um, that there is still dissent um, and it's not an echo chamber. They are actually still free to criticize each other. But then at the same time, it, I think it's important for people to not focus too much on their differences and find ways to, to sit at a table and, and, and talk and focus on the things they do agree about. No, and, I think that's super important. Um, and you know, I get said, I get told all the time, which is really funny because I still consider myself vaguely on the left, although I see myself as wholly independent, I, I think for myself and wherever that lands me on the spectrum, I don't care. Um, but uh, I get told, it's like, oh, you only are willing to associate with the right wing people. It's like, that's not my decision. They won't, nobody else invites me. And I will talk to basically anybody who invites me. Uh, it's just, that's and you're doing that. So this is kind of why I moved into this area because I wanted you to uh, t tell me a bit about this webinar series that you're doing with Thaddeus Russell. Oh yeah, Thaddeus. Um, so yeah, uh, Thaddeus is definitely a leftist. Uh, <laughs> he's a libertarian though. I mean, he's an anti, I don't know, he describes himself as a libertarian. So I can't, I don't want to speak for him. Don't let me, right. I don't, I don't want to go too far with that, but he, he's definitely anti-totalitarian. I have not met somebody more anti-totalitarian than him. So when I say he's a leftist, he's not a leftist in the sense that he is uh, like woke or, you know, one of these totalitarian types that people are usually associating with leftists. I don't think he's a statist, but I, we haven't discussed it directly. So we're doing a three-part webinar lecture series right now outlining the roots of, we're actually going through the texts themselves of some of the core texts of critical theory, postmodernism, and eventually we're going to get into the woke stuff a little bit more uh, in the third one. So we covered some of critical theory already. We're going to finish critical theory and get into postmodernism in the next one. And then the third one, we're supposed to hit woke stuff. Um, probably focusing a lot on Crenshaw, but he wants to bring up some of the queer theory stuff. And then Thaddeus and I don't agree on a lot of these things. We have lots of points of agreement and lots of points of disagreement. He sees himself in a philosophical, go you know, deep with it real quick because it's actually relevant. He sees himself as Hegelian. I see myself as Spinozan. Those two people are not compatible in terms of their fundamental philosophy of how the world works. I don't know how you can be anti-statist and Hegelian since Hegelian's, Hegel's belief was that the perfected state is the avenue to freedom, but fine. He feels consistent in what he believes. He sees himself as a postmodernist. I'm certainly not uh, a postmodernist, but I am actually willing to give all of these thinkers, the critical theorists, the postmodernists, their due and criticize them where they need to be criticized. And then to debate back and forth, like Thaddeus and I in particular disagree very profoundly on the nature of science and the knowability of things in the world. And we've had a few times that we've now, whether it's a podcast, I've been on his Renegade University thing he does, I've doing this webinar with him. In all of these, we will disagree, we have or will disagree about the nature of science, and we will do so productively, we won't call each other names, we will do so in ways that draws out themes from both sides of the argument so that the people who are viewing it can hopefully get something out of that from both sides. And even like I, we're trying very strongly in what we're doing now to represent the critical theorists and the postmodernists as honestly and fairly from their own perspective as we can and not just criticize, but we're also critiquing where we need to. Um, I take so, it he, he agrees that two plus two equals four though. He does, yes. He still believes in reality. <laughs> But I don't know what he would, I should ask him what he would think about the proposition that is that just an element of hegemonic knowledge, you know, that's, that's a point that's up for debate. I can't speak to what he would say, but he does seem to be pretty realistically grounded. His belief is that, um, as far as I understand it, is that the powers that be, as we are experiencing right now, for sure in the world, 
have a proclivity to start to procl proclaim that they are the sole arbiters of what is and is not true, and you have to go along with them, and therefore they exercise power through claims to knowledge. Listen to science, you know. Don't don't talk to your friends right now. Don't go visit anybody. Don't leave your house. Listen to science. Um, you can see the elements of social control connected to knowledge claims very clearly. And Foucault was very uh, prolific and very clear about the the threat there. Um, there are other elements, whether it's with any of these, but certainly we don't agree on all these points. We do agree with some, but he's on the left and he'll talk to me and we get along. I think we actually get along quite well. We're, I would consider him a friend um, and we don't have to agree. Same thing is like, literally I can bounce out of his webinar or podcast or I'll get off the phone with him. And then literally in the next minute, call a right wing conservative and sit down and they want to come at the whole thing from a Christian perspective. And I can listen, we can talk, we can get into theology, and then I'm not a Christian. Uh, so we can do the whole thing there and try to understand it from different perspectives and try to bring light to some common issue. Where it falls apart, though, is where you have two people whose goal it is is to browbeat the other into seeing it wholly their way rather than to try to draw out, like, okay, you see this problem this way, I see it that way. Those aren't necessarily compatible, but we see the same problem together. You know, that, that's a different avenue. And so I, I feel like, or I hope I'm quite good at that. Um, I aspire to be good at that. Uh, so I, I don't know if that's what you wanted to know about that webinar series, but. Well, it sounds interesting and you've done one already. So I'll, I'll put a, a link in the video uh, description so people can go check it out. But um, do you, are they going to be available? Because you have to have an account or something right now to, to view them? Will I don't know the full deal. It is a registration only event. If you register, you certainly will be able to watch the one that has already transpired and will be able to participate live in the two that have not. And that will you know, when it switches to two and one, that'll be true still. And then afterwards, I know that they'll be available to purchase, to download, but I don't know how his system works. I just show up and participate. So I don't want to speak for something I don't know. Um, I try not to do that. Okay. Um, thank you so much for talking to me. Um, and uh, hopefully we can do this again. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, uh, you know, grateful to that you're actually doing so much and, and that you're able to reach so many people um, through uh, your Twitter account and, and um, your website that you mentioned. People should definitely go see it. It's, it's almost like building your own Wikipedia, this um, dictionary. I, I'm trying, yeah. <laughs> it's, and I'm doing it by myself, which, I mean, New Discourses has articles, some of which are by me, many of which are not by me. It has uh, podcasts that I think are all by me. There are videos here and there. I'm not that good at videos. And then um, I'm building that encyclopedia and I'm doing that by myself. Helen helped a little bit at the beginning. I should give, give credit where it's due, but I'm more or less writing that alone. Writing an encyclopedia on top of trying to keep up with everything else. I know. Well, That's thanks for everything you're doing and thanks for having this chat with me. Yeah, absolutely. It was good.